All right, should we uh, get started, you think, or you want to wait a little more? I think last time we had like 13 people, so, but we can start. Yeah, I think it's like pretty close. Um, all righty, let me just pull up my slides. Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the second lecture on DApp architecture or DAP architecture. I'm honestly not really sure. Uh, I'm Andrew Kirilov. I uh, also helped uh, sort of plan out the last lecture with Diego and he's going to be helping me present this one as well. Uh, so excited to get into it. I'm uh, actually the co-head of education here at Blockchain at Berkeley and I've had a little bit of experience teaching the fundamentals decal, but this will be my first time taking a stab at developers. So. Um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask as many questions as you feel you need to. Um, but yeah, so last lecture we talked about um, the sort of traditional web to stack, um, the MERN stack specifically in our case, just to, uh, you know, to have an example. Um, and we, we did mention at the onset that like, you know, we're gonna be planning a whole architecture and figuring out how the smart contracts fit in as a separate layer in our like motivational crowdfunding application. So today we're gonna be talking about, um, uh, to kick things off, some smart contract design patterns to take a look at, you know, that part of the stack. Um, and, and not to just talk about like, you know, what does Web3 do? How does MetaMask work? Um, and how does Solidity work? But, you know, maybe what are the, the conventions that we could use similar to conventions like the MERN stack? Um, after that, we'll, we'll demo actually uh, a version of this like crowdfunding contract just to show off a couple of the patterns that we talk about. Um, and then we'll also show off a demo of the MERN stack as we described it yesterday to show you how these two things might play off of one another. And then we also include some discussion of like alternative stacks that you might use, uh, maybe services that you can leverage to make development easier for you. Um, so to begin with some uh, smart contract design patterns. So a big topic, we'll, we'll also break it down sort of ahead of time. We'll be talking about two things really. Uh, the first being access control of your contracts and the second being upgradability. Um, and so to the reason why we picked those two as the ones that are the most important is that uh, they require a, a sort of different approach in the context of solidity and sort of blockchain development in general than in, in just software development. And so with access control, you know, you might already be familiar with the idea um, that you just, you basically need to be able to control who can do what in your code. And in our case, in our smart contracts. Um, and so there's a couple of like basic access schemes that might come to mind. Um, the sort of, well, I would say the most straightforward is actually the last one where there's no um, to sort of discriminate access. It's a, uh, it's completely decentralized. Anyone can call the functions on your smart contract. Anyone can read the values off, et cetera. Um, but you could also sort of the next most basic is just having a single owner of a, of a smart contract, like a single developer that's in control of uh, maybe writing the code and also in maintaining the ecosystem. So like calling the functions on the smart contract and things like that. Um, or you could want uh, multiple owners, sort of multiple parties that can interact with your code in different ways and uh, you know maintain rigorous controls of how they do this um, and so sort of probably the most realistic cases is that and uh, uh, you know some some mix of access control policies in different parts of the app um, so throughout our examples of both the the access control for smart contracts and the upgradability patterns for smart contracts we'll be using um, implementations and patterns developed by a company called Open Zeppelin. They sort of, um, I think we've already talked about them in the course, they provide these sort of implementations of common smart contract code conventions that have been audited, that have been tested, so you can know that the code you're working with is secure. So things like access control, safe math, um, upgradability proxies, uh, we're gonna sort of talk about Open Zeppelin's approach to these, but uh, not, not pay too, too close in attention to the, the code that itself that they use. So um, for this first access control policy of having a single owner, Open Zip Zeppelin has um, this contract that they call an ownable contract. And basically what this contract does 
um, is it, it has a, a function modifier called only owner, which means that like uh, you can only the owner and you're allowed to set the address that's the owner um, can call any function that's modified with this. And then there's also functions for transferring ownership to another address or for uh, renouncing ownership, which basically like sending it to a null address or meaning there's no longer an owner on the function. And that would mean that none of the only owner functions could get called anymore. And so we see on the left here, um, what that might look like if you have some function, sorry, uh, where you're like taking some administrative action, you would protect it with this only owner modifier. Um, and uh, sorry, so like omitted here, actually omitted here because you don't need to say is that the owner is set by default uh, when the contract is deployed as the contract's deployer. So that's like the first person that would be able to call this administrate function. And then if they want to allow another address to call that function, they would have to transfer ownership with this like elect thing right here. And if they want to like renounce ownership and like uh, let go of all those functions that use only owner, you know, maybe you have it looking like this. So this might give you an idea of like sort of the um, protocol uh, scheme that it would fit into of like, okay, maybe when we're bootstrapping our protocol, we have an ownable contract where just the maybe one address on the dev team uh, controls like the functions in it, but then we will have a means of like renouncing this ownership later on when we plan to decentralize fully. Um, so this is open Zeppelin sort of pattern for a single owner of a contract. Um, but a more flexible and, and realistic scheme is uh, that of role-based access control. So basically you're like defining a set of roles that can take different actions within your application and um, you're safeguarding those actions with checks of like, okay, does this person requesting to take the action uh, pertain to the role that is necessary? And so um, Open Zeppelin's contract for this is called the access control contract. And it's a little bit more involved. Again, we're not looking at all of the code in it, but basically it has a bunch of functions for setting up and removing roles and also granting and revoking roles. So like having one role say to another role, okay, you get this other role and similarly revoking that. And finally it gets also to do like basic querying on these roles, like how many members are there of a given role and uh, things like that. Um, so the sort of pattern here is that when you define a role, you create some identifier for it. So here we set up this like public constant uh, admin A, it's just like a random value. Um, and when we're setting up a role, uh, we say like, okay, for this role ID, um, give this address, you know, that role. And uh, later on, we can check that like, okay, does a given address have this role ID? So we sort of use these role IDs uh, in our, our checks and our setting up of these roles. Um, and while this seems very, uh, I don't want to say basic, there's like, you know, a, a little bit of, uh, you know, edge cases you have to figure out and, and things like that. Um, it, it is pretty straightforward, just like, okay, we've got roles, you either pertain to a role or you don't, and we have to check that you do before you do something. Um, it, it enables some pretty strong sort of like conceptual tools for you to use, and that's these security uh, principles of least privilege and separation of responsibility that you're probably familiar with sort of intuitively anyway. But the idea that like, in the case of least privilege, it lets you say now like, okay, some arbitrary user, um, they can only take this set of actions and they're not sort of like given more privilege than they are needed to. Um, where we don't like trust that users don't go calling functions that we don't want them to call. And we can enforce that now with role-based access control. And similarly, we have the separation of responsibilities that like, if I have some sort of like designated type of user in my application, maybe some sort of maintenance user, um, they have a specific set of responsibilities that I allow them to take with role-based access control. And I can be sure that they can't like sort of step outside of the bounds of their duties. Um, so this, these are like a good, good things to keep in mind when you're designing an application sort of frameworks to, to build along. Um, and finally, there's an access control policy called time locking that is like arguably strict, like falls into the bucket of access control. This is like a, a common tool used in governance. Um, but basically this is when like, you know, maybe there are some roles, some administrators in your ecosystem and you wanna make sure that only administrators can take a certain action. Um, 
you still might have to deal with like uh, not trusting someone to whom you've already granted this access. So like, what if one of my admins start misbehaving and like calling functions in ways that I don't want them? Uh, you know, a common uh, sort of issue that we want to guard against is if we have a protocol that has like some sort of governance, like maybe some uh, development team that rotates in new members every once in a while. Um, we want to make sure that this rotating team can't just sort of stalemate and say like, oh no, we're never going to hand over like our multi-sig keys. Um, if they want to like do an action like that or like introduce protocol changes that the rest of the community doesn't agree with, we can make sure that all of these changes go through what's called the time lock. They get delayed and that gives the community and the other like devs time to uh, adjust and like maybe withdraw their funds from the smart contracts or things like that. So it allows us to, uh, yeah, just sort of cue any action that needs to be taken by the smart contract into this like, into this delay. And that gives us time to adjust if, if need be. And this is probably like, the, uh, it, it's like a pretty complex contract that Open Zeppelin has written for this. So we don't go into it very deep at all. I'll just, again, expose the basic pattern and you're free to look at this if you want to on your own. Um, but basically, uh, and another thing that's cool about this is that it actually leverages the other um, access control um, and owner contracts that we looked at before. Um, but really quickly, I just wanna take a look at the chat here. Um, Aaron is asking, uh, could you elaborate on what Ketchik 256 is? Yeah, Ketchik 256 is a, um, is just a, a hash function. So similar to SHA-256, if you're familiar with that, essentially what it does is it takes in an input of arbitrary length and produces like a perfectly random looking output of uh, 256 bytes in length. Um, yeah, so we use it for like making unique IDs and things like that. Um, so, uh, but, but anyway, so for this uh, time lock contract that Open Zeppelin implemented, there's three basic roles. Uh, the first is just like, um, well, actually, before we get into the rules, uh, the sort of contract structure that they expect you to use here is like, um, let's say I have some contract containing my logic, like this is my crowdfunding contract where we actually have like projects that you can donate funds to. That will be an ownable contract. And there will be another contract that sort of like sends transactions to it or like an address that like calls functions on my actual logical contract. Um, and that contract will be a time lock controller. It'll inherit from this time lock contract and it'll be set as the owner of your logic contract. So like all of the actions that you wanna make sure are time locked are gonna be taken by this time locking contract um, on a logic contract that's like said to be owned by the time lock. Um, and then finally within the, the time locked contract itself, the one that can be used to schedule actions to be taken um there's a, a set of roles so there's three basic roles that are managed with and by inheriting from the access control contract which is kind of cool and those are the roles of the administrator the admin the proposers and the executors so the admin's job is pretty um pretty straightforward it's just like assigning who is the proposers going to be like what is that set of uh, people and who are the executors going to be um so the real sort of important roles here are the proposers and the executors. And basically what the proposers do is just schedule functions to be called, like schedule actions to be taken. So cue them into the time lock. And then executors, what they'll do is like actually call those functions once they verify that a sufficient amount of time has passed. So we can see like an example structure on the left here where like we have some like sort of initialization logic that we've just omitted here for the sake of uh, space on the slide. Um, and that's where we would like, you know, set up the admin role and things like that. But basically what proposers would do is call this uh, schedule admin, admin function, which I, you know, intended to mean like schedule administrate. So like I want to administrate something, but I schedule it in the future. And you see it has this only role modifier on it, which means like only proposers can do this. Um, and you don't really have to worry about the syntax here. Basically it's saying like schedule um, on this contract, like on my logical contract, this function um, and the rest of this, like you really don't have to worry about. And, and similarly, we have um, sort of what the executors would call once it's like gone through a sufficient amount of delay, um, they would be able to call this function like uh, exec admin or execute administrate 
uh, which only executors can call, where we just basically go ahead and actually call the function on this contract uh, with the parameters and whatnot. Um, so that's basically how time locking works. I know it got a little bit hairy with all like the different roles and the two contract setup where you have like the ownable logic contract and then the time lock controller contract that's actually controlling this one and calling functions on it. So do we have any questions about time locking and I guess also about the other two access control patterns we just talked about? All right, if not, we'll move on to uh, upgradable contracts in a second here. Cool. Um, so the next sort of uh, big concern for, for uh, blockchain developers outside of like, you know, I'm in an adversarial environment, how do I make sure I have the right access control in place is, well, I'm also in this environment where my code is um, effectively immutable. Like once I um, post a contract to the Ethereum blockchain, um, its address is defined by its content. If I ever want to change that code, I would have to like deploy it to a different address. And so if I want to tell people like, here, here, come use my contract, it's at address A, and then I make an update, I have to go tell everyone like, oh, actually, you know, change all your functions to now point to address B. It's very inefficient. Um, so it's, it's a difficult problem of like, how do we actually efficiently like iterate on our code and update it um, in this immutable context that we find ourselves in? And the idea here is to use something called a proxy contract, which will forward transactions, like uh, similarly to the time lock controller that we just looked at, it'll like forward function calls to a logic contract. And so the idea is that the address of the logic contract can change. So it can be updated, different code can be written, um, but the proxy contract will always keep using the same one and it'll just make what are called delegate calls to this logic contract to execute functions in it. Um, and I think y'all have learned about delegate calls. Um, uh, can, can someone actually just like confirm, maybe put a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you've ever heard of this? I, all right, well, I guess I'll assume that that's a no. Thank you, Smeet. Yeah, um, so delegate calls. Now, I'm not going to give you the whole rundown on them because I'm also not super familiar with exactly how they work. But um, the idea with delegate calls is that it, it's like one contract calling a function on another smart contract. But when that function gets executed, um, even though it belongs to like this other contract, it gets executed in the context of the first contract. And what that means is that it has access to the same um, sort of variables that are defined in that first contract, and it's in the same memory space. So the layout of storage is also identical to what's going on in that first contract. So that means like if I've got contract uh, A with, uh, and then contract B with the function foo, um, when A like delegate calls foo, um, if A has some variable like whatever, uh, like bar, then like the function foo would have access to the variable bar. Or rather it might uh, inadvertently overwrite the variable bar because now it's at, like working in that memory space. Um, so basically like the, the way to package that up into one sentence and remember it is that when we delegate call a function, that function is executed in the context of the proxy of the calling contract. Um, and so since it sort of uses the storage space of the calling contract, how do we make sure that our functions that we're calling in the logic contract don't accidentally overwrite state variables in the proxy? Um, so like basically like if this function in the logic contract, if the first thing it does is like save to some variable that's like defined in the first storage slot of the contract, that would overwrite the first storage slot of the proxy contract. So there's a couple of ways that we can uh, sort of ensure that we can safely up keep updating our logic contract in a way that we don't accidentally overwrite something we need in the proxy contract. Um, and there's three patterns for this that opens up when talks about. Um, the first is called inherited storage, where both of these contracts, the proxy and the logic contract, 
they inherit the same storage structure. So that means they have like the same variables in the same places in the same order. Um, and so uh, what this allows us to do is have like each subsequent logic contract version, every updated version, it'll have to have the same storage structure. So the same like set of variables as the previous one in the same order. But we can also add new ones on the end. Because if we add new ones on the end, um, we're also like sort of adding to that extra uh, storage space in the proxy contract. And we know not to like, if there's anything in the proxy contract that we want to make sure it doesn't get overwritten, um, it wouldn't get added sort of at the end. It would already be included in that inherited storage. Um, so this way we can like continue adding new variables sort of to the bottom of the contract storage space. Um, but we can't really change the storage structure uh, across versions uh, because that would require us to change the storage structure in the proxy contract, which we can't change the proxy contract. Its address has to stay the same. Um, so uh, another sort of simpler um, approach to this is called the eternal storage. It's very straightforward, but like sometimes where, like if this is all you need, the most straightforward option is usually the best, but this is pretty simple. This is just like, we define some initial storage structure at the beginning. So some set of variables that uh, essentially we decide this is all our contract will ever need in the future. And we have the, similar to the previous uh, setup, we have the proxy and the logic contract both uh, store these sets of variables so that they'll start out with the same exact storage structure and we'll just like never let it change. So any changes that we make in future versions of the logic contract can be changes to like the logic within the functions and things like that, but we can't like define new state variables or like change their order, like their composition or anything like that. Um, so yeah, this is like a sort of very, very dry approach, but uh, sometimes like there are some situations in which it might work. It's very simple, which makes it, um, makes it good. Cause also in Ethereum, simple code saves money cause it's less gas, right? Um, sorry. And so the final proxy pattern is something called unstructured storage, where um, this, this requires like a, a bit of a closer look at uh, what we're afraid of happening, right? So basically what we're afraid of happening is if we change some variable in the logic contract, um, that is sort of like say we write to some variable in the logic contract that will, uh, in the code in the logic contract, that will write to the same like space uh, that the variable would occupy in the proxy contract. So the, the sort of worst case scenario is that we accidentally overwrite wherever in the proxy contract, we store a pointer to the logic contract, right? Because that has to exist somewhere in the proxy contract. Somewhere there has to be like, okay, this is the address of the logic contract where I'm sending my delegate calls. And if we accidentally overwrite that um, by like writing in some variable when we're executing our logic contract, um, then we're kind of screwed because that will be overwritten. We will no longer have the proper address of the logic contract and any future calls will fail. So really we just sort of have to protect that one value at a minimum, the address of the logic contract. So the idea with unstructured storage is as follows. Um, in the proxy contract, we define a constant. And this constant is a location within the proxy contract storage space. Um, and that location contains the address of the logic contract. And so what's nice about this is that constants don't actually take up storage slots. So we don't have to worry about this being overwritten. So right now that means that we're not worried about losing the location in proxy contract storage where the logic contract address is. That can't be overwritten. Um, and in fact, there's even a, a really uh, low chance of that storage location itself being overwritten. Um, because it's a random location in the actually like massive storage space that any Ethereum smart contract receives. Cause they sort of get a whole like, um, the, like when you uh, have a, a contract, a, a smart contract in Ethereum, the possible locations that storage locations that something can be saved at is sort of the total, the total address space of the system. Um, 
So when we store this like logic contract uh, address in a, a random space in this massive uh, like address space in the storage location, there's a really low chance that something randomly overwrites into it because um, all like fixed size data types uh, in Solidity will get written to the front of the address space, the beginning of it, and all dynamically sized data uh, types like arrays and maps and things like that, they actually are written in in the same way. Their elements are not sort of in contiguous like storage slots, but are actually in random locations. And they're uh, relying on the fact that there's like a very low chance that two dynamically sized like uh, elements like this accidentally overwrite into one another. Um, so like we're, we're already like, uh, like uh, sort of natively deeply rely on this um, low chance of collision. So relying on it against again here by saying like there's a low chance that something collides with like the storage location where we have the logic contract address. It, it's a safe assumption to make. And that's the assumption we make with unstructured storage. And this way we can be sure that we'll sort of like with a very high degree of confidence always have the address of the logic contract in the proxy contract. And um, that's a sort of like the only one storage slot whose integrity we need to preserve. And other than that, um, the logic contract can go ahead and like overwrite willy nilly whatever storage slots it needs. It can like comp make complete use of the storage available to it and not worry about overriding uh, things in the proxy. And this is what the Open Zeppelin um, upgradable proxy contract implementations actually end up using because unsurprisingly it's like it seems like the most flexible option and it is um, for honestly pretty low overhead which makes it a good one um, and we're not going to be taking a look at the code itself or like an example code for using these proxies because um, it's a it's a little bit uh hairy and uh it's not really something you need to worry about right now nor i think for your final projects uh, if you were to be working on like an actual protocol, like working on a project with some friends who that you want to see through to some like uh, level of self-sustainability, um, that you'd probably want to already like be com comfortable with uh, proxies for because you want to iterate on that code um, once it's already in production. But yeah, any any questions about um, upgrading contracts and these upgradability patterns? Check the chat here. How can a memory address be overwritten if it's been reserved by another one? I'm a bit confused. Yeah, so how this would happen is um, basically like we'd have a proxy contract with um, let's say like the first memory address in this contract is some value that we really wanna keep. Um, and now let's say we've got a logic contract where the first value in that logic contract's memory address, like its first memory address, is some value that like we don't really care about and we write into it, like we overwrite it pretty frequently. Now, the issue that happens with when we use a delegate call is that like from the first contract, from the proxy contract, we make this delegate call and it calls a function on the second contract, but it's like this function gets executed in the memory space of the first contract. So when it does that thing where it like overwrites the variable in the first memory slot, um, which like should be okay in the logic contract, since it's getting executed in the context of the proxy contract, it overwrites like that same first storage slot. And that's something that maybe we don't want to happen. Uh, does that make sense? I'm not sure if that really addressed like what you meant by uh, a memory address being reserved. Sweet. Cool. Yeah. Um, if there aren't any other questions, then this is uh, this is where I hand things off to Diego to talk about. Oh wait, I'm lying. This is not where I hand things <laughs> off to you just yet, Diego. We're actually going to uh, take a look at an implementation of. Uh, the crowdfunding application we've been talking about um, in Remix, which I think y'all should be familiar with. Um, and so I just want to preface this by saying 
that this is not perfectly secure code. Um, so please don't like, if you ever want to make like a crowdfunding application, don't just like copy paste this. I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't anyway, but also like if y'all find any potential holes in the code, any exploits, please throw them in the chat because that's sort of like, that's how you should be looking at code in, uh, in Solidity in like the land of blockchain development because there's always hackers looking out there for holes in your code and ways that that can lead to them stealing funds. So you gotta adopt that mindset to, to sort of like write good code at the onset. Um, but the idea with this, I'm gonna try not to pay uh, too much attention to like nitty gritty little things and just show you where, where the logic lies and where some of the patterns that we talked about lie as well. But so for this crowdfunding contract- um, Andrew, you should increase the maybe zoom a little bit in. Oh, that's a great call. Yeah, let me uh, figure out how to, there we go. How's this? It's like a bit much maybe. Yeah, I think it's much better. Great, good call. Thank you, Diego. Um, so in this uh, crowdfunding contract, first things first, you see we're inheriting from Open Zeppelin's access control contract because it makes sense that we're gonna wanna define some roles here. Um, we're gonna remember just to, to sort of like break down what the, the setup in the project was. We've got like donors and project owners, right? That's the basic two user groups. So we might wanna define roles for them. Um, here we're just like defining the data types we need. So we've got a struct for a project, basic things like its name, how much it wants to raise, how much it has raised, when the fundraising period ends, who's donated and how much did they donate? Um, and then also like uh, all the project names, things like that. These are sort of like bookkeeping things. Um, so the first like important function here is uh, creating a project. Basically here, we're just like setting up one of these project objects with a name for the project, a goal amount, a duration, and like who are owners. Um, and so after we like set up sort of the basic fields of the object, you see we go through and we, we do like the setup little thing that we were talking about. So we iterate over this list of owners and we make sure for each of these owners, their uh, owner role is set up. So they all have like um, this role ID basically attributed to them. Um, so pretty straightforward. Um, and then the sort of other, other side of the application, the donors, they're mostly interacting with this function here where you fund a project. So basically what we do is we like pluck the project out of the, the general mapping, um, just ensure that it's still going on basically. Um, and then say like, and here we're, we're making use of payable functions, right? So we're, we're, this is how you like uh, send along the ether that you'll be donating to the project. Um, it's gonna be in the message.value field here. And so we make sure that we keep track that the project has raised that much more and we make sure to mark you down as a donor for this much. Um, and then so finally, uh, let's say that this project has like finished its completion and it's, uh, it's like raised enough money and the duration of fundraising has ended. Um, then one of the owners can go ahead and call this uh, close project function. And actually, um, it's just a relic of uh, sort of an old implementation that I use this require has role check here. I think we could equivalently make this a, a only role owner. Um, oh, actually, I know why that wouldn't work. Um, and I'll talk about it in a second. But first, let's just take a look at sort of the, the basic logic in this contract, or sorry, in this function. Um, where what we do is we pluck out the project, we make sure that it's uh, sort of fundraising period has ended and that it has successfully met its crowdfunding goal. Um, in which case we go ahead and we regenerate this uh, like role ID. And the fact that we need to regenerate this is why we couldn't use the function modifier like I was about to do. Uh, make sure that whoever's calling the function right now is actually a project owner. And if they are, um, then we just go ahead and we send them the fundraised amount for the project. And then we go through and we just like delete the project from the mapping. Um, and finally, um, we, we have to handle the case of like, okay, what if the fundraising period ran out, but we didn't raise enough money? Um, then the sort of 
usual pattern in crowdfunding is that if it didn't raise enough money, the donors will like get their money back. They only donate on the condition that, you know, the project has enough to get itself off the ground. Um, but like we talked about, uh, it's a better design pattern not to push money out to users' contracts, but to essentially like allow them to withdraw, which is why we broke it out into two functions here. We're like, close project is essentially a fancy withdraw function for the project owners. And then um, if the project like, you know, uh, didn't have enough fundraised, it's not that we would just go ahead and push all the money back out to the donors. We would let them instead call this redeem donation function here. And uh, what this does is again, double check that the project has like ended and that it didn't meet its crowdfunding goal. And then it'll send you back however much you donated. Um, so, so yeah, this is pretty straightforward, at least logically. Maybe if some of the syntax is tripping you up, don't worry about it too much. But this is just a highlight. Like this is very basic stuff, just sort of the core business logic that you need. And this is all you need to put in your smart contracts. Other things like profile pictures, et cetera, et cetera, user info, we don't need it here. Um, and it shouldn't live in your smart contracts because of the gas costs, right? Um, and we also use the uh, access control here a little bit, and it shows that it's actually like pretty simple to use, um, and it, it protects your your functions well. So um, yeah, if we have the time, I can even uh, show off how this works. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, um, but we can just make like a. You can see I've been uh, you, I've been testing. We can just make like a quick test for function. Um, and this value is denominated in GUI. That's why it's so massive. Sort of like test for function. It'll be live for a minute. We want to raise this much. And this address uh, will be one of the, I'm sorry, I know the text is really small on the left side there. I don't think I can make it bigger. So I'll just sort of uh, go through this quickly. Let's make a quick project. Um, and then we'll go ahead and we'll fund that project with exactly how much money it needs. Um, so let's go ahead and do that now before it expires. Oh, project doesn't exist because I did it for the wrong one. Um, so let's try that again, fund the project. Cool, so now the project's funded. So if we check it uh, over here, we can see, I know you probably can't see this oh, here. I hope that helps that the goal and the raised amounts are equivalent. So we've raised enough for this project. So we should be good to withdraw if, uh, or rather um, close project if we're one of the owners. So let's, um, let's try doing this with like an incorrect account, i.e. like the current one. If we try to close project on test four, we should get an error saying, okay, well it says a project has not ended, which I'm not sure if that's accurate. Uh, because it should have ended, um, but the minute hasn't passed. Has the minute not passed? Try it again. Let's 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 see. Um, because I, I remember like getting the. Oh, okay, you're right. Okay, cool. So we got the right error message saying that we're not a project owner. We even got the right error message before because the minute didn't pass. But now if I switch accounts to a project owner, uh, which I remember to be this account, and I go ahead and I close the project we can see it was successful and we can also see that um, my ether balance increased. It's that the, the sort of first one after the decimal point, you'll have to trust me that it wasn't there before. Um, I wasn't sure exactly how many decimal places to bump it up to make that obvious. Um, but yeah, so that's just showing access control in practice there. Um, so yeah, any questions about the implementation, try not to, like, there's no real point in asking questions about like really specific things or edge cases, it's more to give you an idea. Um, let's take a look at the chat here. Oh, thank you, Yuvrosh. Um, and you know what, y'all y'all can do this too. Like, uh, um, I, I think like, if you honestly, if you ignore all these require statements, which is a horrible thing for me to say, like you should be coding with security in mind first, and you should be really uh, aware of what requires you need. But if you sort of just look at the core logic and not the security logic, this is a really small contract. Like y'all should definitely um, be comfortable with building something like this by, by the end of this course. Um, but yeah, 
I think it's a good moment to, to now finally hand things off to Diego, who's going to show us what, uh, you know, an implementation of the Mern stack can look like. Thank you, hey, Andrea. Yeah, this was, let me share a screen while I do that. Um, oh, wait, that's the one, this is the one I want to show. Cool. So, hi, guys. I'm back. If you remember from last lecture, um, if you don't remember me, head of consulting, well, co head of consulting for BAB. And I just graduated in December. But I just wanted to say, Andrew, that was amazing. Um, something I wanted to emphasize that Andrew talked about is the fact that that is just like one of the layers in the entire uh, web app uh, stack that, well, the app stack that we've been talking about. And as you saw, like in, in the case, just speaking about the crowdfunding application, as I told you guys last lecture, that contract is just handling the money, uh, the crowdfunding and the uh, donation, the, the donation and the distribution of the money, right? So that is, that's the only thing you want in the smart contract. For everything else, authentication, uh, storing metadata, storing images, storing the uh, project info, like anything else, you want to store it in a centralized database because you don't you don't you don't want to pay for that gas, right? It, there's more efficient ways of doing it, and that is not the and that's not about like that information is not the business or like main yeah the business logic of your app right like you're starting supplemental data to complement what you have on the, on the smart contract so um going back to that with, with that in mind i just wanted to remind everyone of the merge stack right so we have these four main components right we have react for the user interface specifically in the merge stack and then you can from react directly interact with the smart contract so web3 allows us well you can have a wallet in the browser that allows you to inject web3 from the client and then that way you can interact directly with the smart contract and call all the functions that Andrew was showing in Remix. You can do that from the front end when you click a button or something like that. Same thing, but just through Web3. And you will need to import some ABIs and some other stuff from the uh, for this specific smart contract into the into the user interface. But that's a, that's not something that should be really hard. The, the hard part is writing the contract and making sure the logic is right. And then uh, the other two components that are essential for the Merge stack is the web server. Essentially, uh, this is Node. It allows us to run the JavaScript in the back end. Uh, it allows us to process all those HTTP requests. Uh, if you guys remember, get, post, put, and delete. And then uh, it essentially allows us to route those requests into the database, which in this case is Mongo. And we use Mongoose to interact with the database. So with this stack, you have all the components, all the tools you need in order to build an entire D app. And uh, I hope that's becoming clear and, and that's been like the main point of these two lectures. Now, uh, if there's any questions right now, you guys can, let's see, there's a chat question. Okay, it was just um, your app. Well, I don't, I'm, I don't think I pronounced your name correctly, but I think it's really cool. But let me know uh, if there's questions on this. Else, I'm gonna give a demo of what a D app looks like, like how I would structure my code, how I actually connect to the database, uh, how I set up a web server, um, how do I make a React front end? I just want to show you guys in code how that looks like. This application, I don't even, I don't, as, as same idea as with the smart contract, it, it's not important the details. What's important is the, the main framework of how the code is organized and all the different components. And I, wa I want to share this code with you guys because if you, uh, if you end up building a D app for this uh, class, then I think this will be extremely useful to essentially. Um, allow you like you know have some foundation foundational code that you can use and just copy and to get your application going all the boiler boilerplate code as, as many people say so with this in mind um i want to talk about how i will structure my code for the mern stack so essentially i have two folders the first one is the client um as you know we from the client server architecture we always have a client this is what the user uses to interact or connect with the server or the back end so I have all my front end code in the client. So this is essentially a React application. And um, I want to show you guys the entry point to this React application from the browser. So I'm actually going to go into, um, into the client. And I'm going to run npm start. This is just going to run my React application by itself. And we should see it pop up very soon in the browser here. Um, And you guys will see the UI is horrible, but it's just for purposes. Okay, so my app is running here in localhost 3000, and there, there's a server, the front end server running. If you guys remember, there's two servers, front end and back end. So this is the, the client server running. So the first thing I want to show is the entry point, right? So 
if we go and we go inspect element into this page, uh, we're gonna see this this doc type HTML, which is what the browser sees. This doc is called index.html, and this is what you see in here. Uh, if we go to public index.html, this is exactly this document. Everything here is public to the browser. So this is exactly what you see in here. Uh, you will see all the messages, uh, React app, it's literally this line right here. And then you're gonna see this div element called root. So this div element called root, essentially, well, this does do some styling, CSS code that we have. Uh, and then we have this body. And then here we have the, div, the, I, the root element. This root element contains the nav bar that you're seeing here and this header called the landing page. So where is this information coming, right? Because in here we just specified root. Well, this comes from a app. Well, in this case, it's going to come from index.js, which is essentially exporting an element called root. And the, the details don't matter. I just want to for you guys to like understand the story of how this is getting transferred to the browser. And we have an element called app, which is identified by root. So this this is called app.js. If you guys see from this info right here, and this app.js is the first like main element in your entire React application. It's kind of the entry point. Like this is where you will start writing code. Everything that I just showed before, React gives you uh, by default. Um, so in uh, in this application, I have two routes. The first one is just called slash, and the second one is called slash prices. So uh, the first one renders a page called landing, a component called landing. And the second one re re renders a component called prices. So right here, we're rendering that component called landing because uh, we have this only one slash. But if I go and write slash prices, this is going to render another component that, well, I don't know why it went to a new page, but this is going to render the prices component, which is this right here. And it's just a, a table that I'll, I'll show later what how it's being rendered. But um, we're doing, we're going like top down. So don't worry about these error messages for now. So we have this, the first thing I just want to show is a landing component. So this landing component is essentially, I have two folders called one screens and one components. Screens are kind of for the building blocks of the application. So if we go to landing, this is just a React component that has a nav bar in here that says cryptocurrency prices. And this is what you guys see here, cryptocurrency prices. And then this is a, is as a header called landing page, and I can add whatever I want here. Maybe Andrew's demo was cool, and we should be able to see this in the app. So yeah, it's just you know you can change whatever tags you want and add whatever front end you want. So now the next thing here is there is a href. So href is essentially a link to another page. In this case, it's a link to the prices component. And we know how to get there because we defined a route called prices here for the prices component. So if we click on this button right here called cryptocurrency prices, we're going to get routed to this a component called prices. So let me go into that page. So this is the prices component. It's a little bit more complex in logic, uh, but I'll try to keep the story of what it's doing. So we have essentially the same nav bar as before, which is this thing up here. But instead of saying cryptocurrency prices, it's just saying landing page. And then we have this bit of code. This is something really cool that React allows you to do. If you put things in brackets, it allows you to write code. So I essentially have an if statement that says, if I'm done, done noting information, I, I, I want to render an exchange table, uh, which is a component I defined up here that I'll show you guys. Else, I just want to show the, le the header called loading exchange rate. So you might see there's a small lag in here uh, that I, mean, I don't know if you guys are able to see that, but it says loading exchange rates and then it's rendering the table. So this done loading variable is something I use to identify uh, when, yeah, or, or to show when um, the page has done loading. So if you remember from React, I don't think we got a React specific lecture. But there's this thing called hooks that allows you to fetch information. So uh, in this case, I am making a, I'm using Axios to make a request to this Coinbase endpoint. And I can show you guys what this endpoint is doing in Postman. Um, Postman just allows you to make requests to specific endpoints. So if we send this information, 
Coinbase, this is essentially just a get a query that we're making. It gives us exchange rates. So we have the base currency as USD, which is the default. And then I'm going to look for Bitcoin and tell you guys what is the current, uh, the well, the current one USD is how many Bitcoin? Well, it's something to the negative five. But if I change this to be, I believe currency equals BTC, it's right there. I already did it before. I'm sending an argument in the request. Now my base currency is Bitcoin. And if we go to see what one Bitcoin is in USD, we should be able to see that, well, one Bitcoin is 32 ETH. And then the, where's USD? USDC, well, USDC, right? Stable coin. So $57,000 essentially is the price of one Bitcoin. So this Coinbase API just allows you to query essentially exchange rates. So that's essentially what I'm doing here. I'm using Axios. And you might see this thing called a wait. This just means like, I don't want to execute this line of code until I actually get a response from this endpoint. It's obviously not immediate. It's asynchronous. We don't know when we're getting the response. So that's why we use a wait because I don't want to save in the state. This is some state of my component. I don't want to save in the state, the response that I get, which is called in this case, response, the data, the data, the currency and, and rates in the state of my component until it actually returns. And I can show you guys what the response of this looks like um, in here, if I just console it, when we go back to the website and then we go to the console, you guys are gonna see here, um, we get a status 200, which is correct. And then we get this data variable in here and then we get an another data um, variable. It's a huge JSON object. And then we get the base currency USD and then a bunch of rates, which is essentially what I just showed you in, Post in Postman. Uh, but I'm accessing those, I'm accessing this stuff by accessing the currency and the rates in the code through this dot, I guess. Yeah, using the dot normal, that same that you would use to index into an object. So uh, then what I just do there is once this is one, once I receive that information, I save it in the state into these variables called base currency and exchange rates. And then I have this extra state variable that is called loading or downloading because initially it's false. Like initially I'm just loading the elements, right? And I want to know when I'm done loading. So after I'm able to save this, I set downloading to true. So when done loading is set to true, React knows that I have access to exchange rates and the base currency. So it goes from rendering this header called loading exchange rates to actually rendering, rendering a table that, ha that has all this information. So that's the key of this downloading is a statement. Uh, so again, yeah, if you see this, you're going to see loading exchange rates and then at when React knows, oh, now we're done loading because I signal it through this variable. Well, now we can we can render the exchange table. So this exchange table uh, is just a component. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, it's just you know like regular HTML. How you would define um, um, how you would, you would define a table. Define define some headers, and then I have a function to essentially dynamically construct the rows of the table here. Uh, but no need to go into that. I think that's not that relevant. So now we essentially have a React app that is able to route me from two pages. It queries some information from some API and renders it in a table. Now, a question for you guys is this is just front end, right? Like we have no database connected. So uh, if there's no questions, I'll stop for a second. Uh, I know this, this has been fast, but I stop for a second for any questions on React or maybe like if, if this makes sense, like I've just, I've just looked at the front end of my application. I haven't gone into any of the back end. So, how, how are you guys doing? Uh, tell me. Yeah, I, I had a quick question regarding like the index page. So you had like an index.js file. I was oh, wondering yeah. whether you whether you have HTML code there or whether the .html file is somewhere else. So I have index. So I have an index. So there's two folders, right? The first one is the public folder. So this is literally what the browser receives by default. If you and the browser will open a file called index.html. So this is kind of the entry point to the app that I show you guys later. And this is pure HTML. Like this is you, you can see like there's yeah, this is pure HTML, right? In addition, yeah. we have the index.js file where we can actually write JavaScript. And don't worry how, just know that what this index.js interacts with this index.html to transfer this app object into essentially here where it says div id root. And this, is what right. you see, and this is what you see in here when I call inspect. 
a we can see a body this this is html whatever it's literally the same message that, you, that we're seeing here well this is the body so this is like this is the entry point right this is what the what this is rendering and then uh, the what you you're gonna see this div element and this is what allows you like to to actually then uh, run all the code that you've written in app.js and all the other components Make sense? Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Thanks, Diego. Okay, cool. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, how you would add a backend to this. So essentially, what I do is I first add a a backend folder. Let me close these tabs for now. I create a backend folder just to kind of separate the two things. And also, we have two servers running because we also need to run some JavaScript in the backend. So I'm, I'm first gonna stop running the, the server for now. Uh, I'm gonna go back to, well, I'm gonna go into the backend folder now. So as you guys can see, we also have node modules. And then I have a full, I have a, I have a file called server.js. So server.js is a file that allows me to essentially uh, run some JavaScript to connect to the database. So first, let me show you guys the database that I set up. So if we go to MongoDB Atlas, uh, this allows you to create a new database. So you can just go create database. And then you can have uh, different collections. If you remember in Mongo, you can have different collections between each database, right? So in here, uh, we have a database called, where is it? I believe it's, I don't know what it's called. Demo app, um, no clusters here. Well, cluster zero, but I believe collections we have two collections in this database and we have a i guess this one is called my first database and we have a rates collection so this rates collection currently has no elements um but we're going to start adding into them and remember this is kind of a bucket you can just throw json files into this into this database so um i have this database kind of set up here right ready to receive information so in my server.js file you guys are gonna see, this is just like a bunch of um, import like configuration things, no need to really understand, but this is sets up Express and remember Express will allow us to kind of understand the requests and route them to the correct endpoint. So we just essentially uh, set up Express here. Don't worry about this. Then we set up the port for, we set up a port for the server for the backend. You know, uh, from the previous demo, we were running on 3,000 up front end. So I just set up the backend for 4,000 so that there's no collision. And then we uh, define Mongoose, right? And, and uh, like, I guess, import Mongoose. And Mongoose, again, allows us to connect to the database. So what I do here is there's this URI that MongoDB gives you to connect to the database. And you can literally look up the code. I'm just having a hard time uh, seeing where this is. If we go to overview, um let me see oh cluster i remember i think i remember um here connect you have this cluster set up so we can connect and then you literally say connect your application look this is the code that i'm using literally okay we have a uri which is what i have here and then i'm using mongoose they don't use mongoose i think they use their own client but i use mongoose i give this uri with a password that i define up there um, I guess it's specific to this database. You put it passing some parameters and then this is just gonna connect to the database. So if there's an error, you catch it there. Else uh, you can essentially open the connection and print to the, to the console, oh, okay, but the connection was successful. And then there's a server running on port 4000, which is this Node.js server. So something I wanna show you guys, I configured the backend. So in packages of JSON, such that you we run concurrently the front end server and the well the front end server is the client and the back end server. So if I do your npm run dev, you guys are gonna see several messages. The first one is concurrently npm run start and npm run client. So we are running um okay cool. So we are we essentially says say connection with MongoDB was successful. So uh, this is this line right here. This was a successful connection. And then it's, the server is running on port 4000. And then we're also starting the development server, which is the React one. So we're running on 3000 and 4000. So now 
uh, we are connected to the database. So now what can we do with this? So as, as, I, as I probably mentioned before, we can define like models for the database. So in here, I kind of just defined something related to the exchange rates. So I defined a, a model that essentially uh, has three parameters. The first one is a from currency, which is an exchange rate from this base currency to this next currency, which is the second parameter, and then an exchange rate between the two currencies. And I'm saving this in a collection called rates. So this is something passing here. So then in the server, uh, well, there's with, I'll worry about that in a bit. Um, if we go to routes, I have essentially two routes. The first one is a get route to get all the exchange rates in this collection. So we are essentially importing this from this file, which where we export the exchange rate. And then we're able to find all the elements inside, uh, I guess, all the elements that are exchange rates inside the routes collection that we define, rates correction that we define there. And then we have a post endpoint to create a new, a new, to create a new exchange rate. So this essentially allows us to get some information from the request body. In this case, we're getting some from currency information, to currency information, and a conversion rate between the two currencies. And then we define a new object, and then we send this to the database. So we do new exchange rate save. And something I forgot to say is you remember in Express there's always a request and a response, right? So we have a request object and a response object. The request might have some parameters, but we send the response obviously to the response. So in here, after we query all the exchange rates, we are gonna, which this is a promise essentially, uh, this is gonna, we were able to send this back to the client. So this is how we propagate the information back to them. And then same thing here, after we save the information, I am, a, I believe console, well, I believe, am I sending this back? I actually don't know. No, I don't think I'm sending anything in the response here. No, yeah, we do. So we, we send this back uh, in the response. So these are two routes that I have set up and Express essentially, when I defined it here in the server, allows us to handle this route. So it essentially, if it receives a, if it receives a get request or a post request to this specific endpoint, it's gonna handle it. And the way I can show you guys that is we have the server running. If I go to Postman and I call localhost 4000, the server is running on port 4000, which is right here, right? And then I call route, which is this thing right here. And then the uh, get route, which is this one that I defined here, I'm gonna be able to retrieve all the uh, exchange rates in the database. Now, this is gonna be empty because there's no exchange rate. I haven't, there's nothing in the database. So to just show you guys how we will do this is from the front end to put something, I'm gonna go back to the client. I'm gonna go to the prices screen that we saw before. And then there's this little bit of code that I have here. So inside this hook that always runs at the beginning, I'm just gonna um, define an object called from currency that will have three, three fields from currency to currency and a conversion rate. And I'm gonna call actual post to this route, which is route create new exchange rate. And I'm gonna console the, console the log the response. I'm pretty sure this should have already been done because the file, the app was reloaded. So if we go to the console, uh, well, let me see, I'll just do it again. If we go to the prices, here, we should be able to see a status 200 route create new exchange rate. And then this is the data that we sent. So now if I go to the database, I'm pretty sure we're going to see it here. So cluster zero, if we go to collections and we go to uh, here, this one, you see, we exactly have the object that we just pushed. So this, if we now go back to Postman, now we should get that object back. So if I send this, now we have the object back, which has all the information in the database uh, that we just pushed. So that's essentially uh, what I wanted to show. And right now this doesn't make that much sense, but I'm, I'm just trying to give you an idea of how you set up a database, how you connect to it, how do you define the schema? How do you define routes to handle different uh, requests? In this case, a route to handle the get all exchange rates, uh, for example, route. And then uh, how do you actually call this route from the client? So how would you actually call your MongoDB database after you click a button from the client? Well, you can just use Axios. And then this route, this is sending a post request 
to this route. So it's gonna the server is gonna respond to it and be the backend server is gonna respond to it and be able to take action. So that was a long demo. Uh, I don't know if everything made sense until now. Uh, kind of how things are connected. You guys, I hope can you will get access to this code. Uh, uh, yeah, I haven't uploaded the code. I will send it to you guys later. Uh, um, and you guys can see this. I know it, this might be a little, should have been a little bit fast. If you got this, everything, uh, they'll be crazy. Any questions? No questions. Okay. Uh, cool. With that, there's one last part in this presentation that I want to I want to just want to share with you guys. Um, so, in consulting, um, which is a department I lead, we work a lot with enterprise companies. And something that you always want to think about blockchain is blockchain adds layers of complexity, right? Like thinking about key management, uh, thinking about interacting with a wallet. Like it, it's a lot more complex than interacting with a regular web app. So, there's the industry has built other tools in addition to the Merge stack to build the apps that essentially kind of all this, all this code that I just showed you, you don't need to write it. You just write the smart contract, you upload that, and then you have an entire web app connected to, the, to that smart contract. Um, and you might be hinting, well, this is essentially something AWS and Microsoft Azure, which are cloud services, have developed. So what I just wanted to share with you guys now is a stack from Microsoft Azure that we used in a consulting project to build a D app. And we didn't need to use the merge stack. Like, of course, all the components are there. Like you need a web server, you need a database, you need a front end and you need a smart contract, but it's kind of all abstracted away from you and you don't need to worry about writing all that code. So I just want, I want to talk about one, it's called Microsoft Azure Blockchain Workbench, one of the stacks. And we're going to go uh, not deeply, it should be pretty, uh, not yeah, I guess on a high level on what, what it's doing. So the first thing I want to say is, what, what this stack allows you to do is to you, for the developer to focus on writing the smart contract. Like you don't want, you don't need the developer to focus on writing a connection to MongoDB, setting up an instance with MongoDB, uh, defining the servers to, to run the, the app. You only want the, the person run, writing the smart contract, giving this to the, to the cloud and the cloud will set up all the wiring for them. So it kind of puts a focus on, on just smart contract code. And then the, uh, the service itself is gonna give you a bunch of APIs that you can use to interact with the smart contract, right? So if I were if I were going to do this in the merge stack, I need Web three. I need Web three to connect to the smart contract and then call all the functions in the smart contract. If I use if I just use Azure Blockchain Workbench, I can just use the APIs they provide me in order to call the smart contract functions. So um, it's kind of very easy on the developer. And also the positive thing about this is for the user. Like when you build something with a merge stack, the user needs to manage their keys, right? They need to use a wallet like MetaMask to be able to approve a, and create a Ethereum transactions a, or blockchain transactions in general. If you if you use something like a Azure Blockchain Workbench, that's handled for the user. The user would just cr create a, an account like for like a Facebook account. You could think about it that way, and they would log in just like they log in for Facebook with a username and a password, and they don't even know they're interacting with the blockchain because all the keys are managed by Microsoft Azure. So that's the positive thing. It's easier on the user. The negative thing is obviously there's a point of centralization where the keys are not managed by the user themselves. They don't even know what are the keys. This is just stored in a key vault that they have. So uh, next slide, I'm going to show you guys the stack. We're going to go like just show the different components and, and what they do. So the first component that we have here is I'm gonna circle it. Uh, don't worry about anything else. Right now, I just want you to focus on this part. Is a client application. This could be a mobile app or this could be a web app that is interacting with a DM. This is just your client, uh, and that's all it's doing, right? So um, this client is gonna interact with something called the gateway gateway service API. So whenever you call a I guess, I guess this is like your express. Like this is gonna process all your get and post requests and route them to the correct resource in the backend. So uh, this is the client and they interact with the gateway service, gateway service API. The second, the second thing I wanna talk about is Azure Active Directory. This is just an authentication service, allows you to set up a login and a password and any user can log into the application and become and be authenticated 
they don't need to have any keys, just login and password. That's essentially what Azure Active Directory is doing. And as I mentioned, we have the Gateway Service API, which is kind of the wiring between the client and all the backend, uh, all the backend stuff. So you might notice something uh, cool here, which is there's an arrow from Gateway Service API into a SQL database. So why do we have a SQL database here? Well, something that Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure decided to do is to have a copy of all the smart contract contents in a centralized database. And this is only one way updates. The smart contract is updated and the changes are propagated into the database. So this centralized database allows us to query very fast for the smart contract contents. You cannot make posts or transactions to this database. Obviously you need to go to the smart contract, but when a transaction is made in the smart contract, it is propagated in the SQL database. So you can access this information from the, uh, from the, from the client much more faster. So it's an optimization. This is one of the cool things of this entire um, stack that one of the ones that I really like that you have this database with all the contents. Cool. In addition to that, uh, I want to highlight this component called the Azure Key Vault. Azure Key Vault just essentially stores all the keys, public and private, for the users. So um, I guess this is um, where yeah, all the key management is done. And you might see that this Azure Key Vault is connected to something called a transaction builder and signer. So this is what builds and signs your Ethereum transactions before they're sent to the blockchain, which is this big component right here. So um, whenever the user triggers an API, let's say a post API to call a smart contract function, this gateway service is gonna go in here, is gonna call the transaction builder, which is gonna get your keys from the Azure Key Vault, uh, sign the transactions and send it to the blockchain. And this could either be a, this could be something connected to the Ethereum public blockchain or you might have something like Quorum, Quorum, if you're familiar with it, it's a consortium blockchain. Um, and this is more for enterprise applications. Maybe you want more privacy. So um, you have a, you have some choice of, of ledgers to use in the in the in the app. So that's basically it. Essentially, uh, to summarize it, you have a client app interact with this gateway service API, which processes all the all the HTTP requests uh, or posts into this application. You have an authentication service. You have a database that is very fast to query from that has has a state in the smart contract. And then whenever you want to make a transaction, they have a key vault that you can use to sign transactions and send them to the blockchain. And you can choose if you want to use Ethereum or an enterprise blockchain that maybe you only have, you only want to have certain nodes, uh, verified nodes to be able to verify transactions in the blockchain because it's, you want more privacy, right? That's the entire idea of a consortium blockchain. Uh, and then, yeah, this is basically it. The final two things that I wanted to say is you have some monitoring, like they allow you, they, they will tell you if there's maybe issues, errors, uh, which is pretty nice. And then you can connect IoT devices. And this is very true for like many blockchain applications. If you're doing supply chain, you're definitely gonna need an IoT device that was gonna send information to the blockchain maybe when a new item arrives to a new warehouse. So this is like a fully integrated solution for your web app that all you need to do is, oh, here, Microsoft Azure, here's the code for the, my smart contract go ahead and build this for me. And then it gives you a bunch of APIs that you use to interact with everything else. And you don't need to worry about how this is all done. So this is probably not very relevant for you guys for the project that you're gonna build, but, and you guys are not gonna use this, but it's just like, I wanted to, you know, give some more insight into other stacks that are out there that is not necessarily the main stack uh, to build the apps. So I know I've talked a lot. If there's questions, please let me know. That's pretty much it. Do you have a good YouTube demo of a short blockchain? Um, I personally don't, but I'm pretty sure there's demos all around for how to build on this on YouTube. Definitely encourage you to look at that. Yeah, and I guess AWS has something very similar to this. And if you know, most of the nodes for blockchains run on AWS, which is kind of ironic because it's kind of centralized, uh, all of that, but whatever. Um, if IWS goes down, probably a lot of networks will go down. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Cool. No questions? Awesome, thanks Diego and Andrew. We can wait for a few questions, but in the meantime, uh, 
In terms of logistics, uh, sorry if I didn't make it clear, but no homework was due today. Uh, we plan on releasing kind of a, a homework to that's comprehensive for both lectures uh, soon and we'll give you ample time to complete it. So don't worry about that. I also updated the grades on the publicly viewable, viewable grade book. So uh, make sure that the records are correct. Also, if you haven't completed assignments, um, we do want everyone to pass and we want everyone to be doing the assignments. So if for some reason you weren't able to complete the assignments or you don't envision that you would be able to complete an assignment by the due date, please uh, reach out via private Piazza post and we can figure something out because um, I'd hate to see you guys uh, get an NP on your, um, on your transcript. And if you have any questions about that, please drop in chat as well. Uh, yes, I will upload the code. I will sync up with Nathan and Solomon to upload the code. And it's in my public GitHub too. So I'll probably just send them, send it to, to them. And uh, something to mention there is, of course, you're going to need to set up your own MongoDB instance, right? You're going to use mine. And I don't, the password is not in, in GitHub. So that's going to work. Um, so you'll need to set up your own database. But you can kind of use that to create that. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. And yeah, just have a, a, a good break. Great, thanks once again to Andrew and Diego. You guys killed yeah. it as always. All right, see you guys. I'm gonna go eat, I'm tired. Right. Yeah, thanks for having me.